So we were um, d discussing um, solid solution um, hardening, and, and we would um, we'd been considering um, a um, theory where, where we look at an edge dislocation and a, an atom at certain distance from that edge dislocation. And that atom has a purely dilatational um, effect on the lattice. That means it's, it's either compressed by the surrounding lattice or it's uh, under tension, isotropically under tension. And so we went through the, the theory and then, and then we calculated um, what would happen, for instance, for uh, atoms like manganese or, or silicon and ferrite. Hmm? And um, so I told you the, the way you, you were calculating the, the interaction force is by first uh, determining the uh, interaction energy hmm? and then um, as a function of position and then doing the derivative of this um, uh, interaction so that you would um, uh, you're able to um, uh, from the derivative then determine what is the maximum interaction force hmm? um, because um, the effect that a, a dislocation has a, or a point effect a, a substitutional atom has on the dislocation will of course depend on uh, their relative position so um, and uh, so, so this is what this this energy uh, comes out to be of course it's function of x and y hmm? in the um, in this um, in the position of the um, atom and then uh, you uh, make the derivative of the this interaction energy so the interaction energy looks like this in this case it's an, an attractive interaction between the um, the atom and the um, uh, uh, the dislocation F for for the particular position we've chosen, hmm? um, and um, and what what I plot here is the the force um, on the uh, on the on the solute. Okay, so um, and and so the force on the dislocation is the reverse, of course, right? Because these two balance, yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and you see this is the, um, the force um, uh, position uh, curve, and, then, and, and this allows us to determine what, what the maximum force is. In this case, it's symmetrical, so um, it's, it's this uh, value here. Um, if I had put, um, in this particular case, uh, it's not shown, but um, the, we have an inter... Um, a, um, uh, an attractive interaction, so the, the potential well, we have a potential well here, yes, uh, because of the relative position of y, the, 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 the y position of the, the atom. If, if I had put it on the other side of the slip plane, the uh, uh, interaction would be repulsive, yes, because uh, as you know, an, an atom, um, if it has a, um, if it's misfitting and it's larger than an iron atom, yes, it will be under compression and it will be, pref uh, it will prefer to be in uh, below the slip plane, yeah? So whether or not it's attractive or uh, repulsive depends on the, on the position of the atom with respect to the, the slip plane. Hmm? Okay. Right. So, um, and, and we could um, derive uh, th th this, this maximum value here, and we found uh, 1.6 times 10 to minus 11. We had already introduced this kind of um, uh, forces, yes? And I also told you that um, I mean you, you could do it this theoretical way, or you can just use a, a simplification of the theory where, where you, uh, if you, if you um, if you know the delta value, you just use g b squared times delta divided by five. Yeah? And um, and just to show you that that it's it's very close to um, uh, what what you get with the um, the more correct equation, you find the same value. Hmm? All right. Right. So um, 
in this particular case, um, we have assumed that we have a, an edge dislocation and a, um, an atom which gives you an isotropic lattice dilatation or lattice contraction. And um, uh, very often in um, introductory material science courses, um, it is said that uh, there will, because of the stress field around an edge dis uh, around a screw dislocation, there will not be interaction between that kind of atom, which has a purely dilatational field, and a screw dislocation. And um, a hand-waving argument would be, well, there is no dilatation or compression around an edge, a screw dislocation. Yeah? And um, so that's not true, right? Uh, the interaction of solutes with substitutional and interstitial atoms is about the same, the strength of the interaction. Hmm? So it's not the case for, uh, for ferrite, definitely not the case. Screw dislocation and edge dislocation interact uh, as strongly with uh, solutes, um, both as, as, uh, um, as strongly with solutes. Uh, first of all, well, uh, one of the things we all assume in, in our theories is, is isotropy. Uh, of uh, iron and iron is not isotropic so that definitely uh, is an important correction. There is, is a, a small dilatation associated with screw dislocations hmm? and in uh, austenite, in austenite of course um, we have uh, relatively low stacking fault energy so e even a screw dislocation will be dissociated in two partials and these always have an edge component. Yeah? So um, these are some general arguments, uh, but, but you can derive it theoretically also. Okay? All right, so uh, let's now turn our attention to the, um, the another uh, aspect of uh, interaction between a, 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 a solute and a dislocation. Um, we can think of uh, solutes as regions, small spheres, where the uh, modulus is different. Yes, modulus is different. So you have different elastic properties. Hmm? Um, so, um, um, so if, if you consider a volume uh, B cube, right, but the, the volume uh, the size of a Burgers vector, in, the th in three directions with a certain shear modulus. It's around the solute atom. So if I put a piece of screw dislocation in that region, yes, um, I, you know, I can calculate the energy hmm? because I know what the energy is of dislocation. Yes? We saw these formulas in the past. So this would, I would apply this formula times uh, B cube here and this would give me this value, okay? Right? And so, I can compare this to the energy um, that the dislocation has in the uh, normal lattice, yes? And so I get a difference in energy, an energy change, hmm? which can be an increase in energy or decrease in energy depending on uh, the relative differences. So, so I get a change in, um, in energy of the dislocation, which, which is simply this uh, equation here and delta G, where I input delta G, delta G being the difference between modulus of the um, uh, solute around the solute and in the in the lattice. Hmm? All right, so uh, and I uh, derived this for uh, screw dislocation or for edge dislocation. All right, okay. So um, if this delta G here is negative, hmm? I get a locally reduced energy of the dislocation hmm? and basically the uh, um, dislocation is bound to the uh, solute because of this re region. It's just this lower energy piece, uh, yes? So a soft atom for instance, uh, like a vacancy or, or a soft atom, yeah, will, will therefore have an attractive interaction with, um, uh, with the dislocation. 
And it's the reverse if we have a, a very rigid atom or very hard atom, yes? Um, the interaction will be mostly uh, uh, repulsive. Hmm? So um, a way to, um, to get an idea of the, the change in, um, that a, uh, an atom has on the modulus, we can, we can determine a parameter epsilon g, which, which gives uh, us a um, quantitative measure for the, the change of the, the relative change of the modulus with concentration. So what you basically do is you make different alloys, yes, with increasing amount of uh, the solute, and you measure the elastic properties. Hmm? You measure the shear modulus. Hmm? Okay. So um, this is what you get basically. Huh? Um, if if I have so you have to imagine I have this location here. I have some solute atom there. Yes. Um, if this solute atom has a lower uh, modulus than the, uh, uh, the, the lattice, then I will have an attractive interaction. And if, it has, if it's a harder atom, there will be a repulsive interaction. Yes? Okay. And so using these uh, two parameters, we can uh, basically, um, as long as we have epsilon and delta, we can basically um, have an idea or determine uh, how much the, uh, the strength of the, um, the interaction will be, the retaining force, the maximum retaining force on the atoms will be. Hmm? So let's um, just, uh, so what, uh, the way you, you kind of have to think about um, the, um, uh, the atoms is not really like atoms, you know, like little regions. Um, and and uh, it, it this location will have an impact on this atom. It, will, it can uh, change, influence the, the, its, its, uh, its volume. You know, for instance, in the edge dislocation in the, uh, in the compression part, it will, the solute will be compressed or it will be uh, expanded, yes, and um, so the size will be changed by the hydrostatic part of the stress field, and the shape will be changed by the shear part of the, the stress field, okay? So, right, and so this is an example, for instance, for uh, of kind of calculations you can make for chromium and for phosphorus for manganese and silicon, where we know the epsilon and the, uh, the, the delta. Huh? It, should be the, it should be delta. It, maybe it's delta and it's, it looks, because it's so small, it looks like an epsilon. And, and you can see, um, you know, uh, what kind of interaction is more dominant. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, for, and, and, and you can determine also how large is the, um, the interaction on the basis of this epsilon uh, and delta values. Hmm? For instance, um, let's see here. Um, for chromium, hmm, you see I have uh, what uh, looks like repulsive interactions, yes? And I have a, um, so the size misfit is positive, the modulus misfit is positive, right? So, um, it's a repulsive interaction between this location and the, the atom. And of these two, the size misfit is, is dominant. And if we look at different elements, what we find is that most of the time, the size misfit is, appears to be most important if you, if you use this approach. Except here for phosphorus, we have apparently a very strong, you can see very high values here, a very strong um, modulus misfit, apparently. Hmm? Good. So, so, so far, um, we have uh, said, uh, so uh, if we know, uh, we can calculate the interaction energy, we can also calculate the, the force that one single atom will have on a piece of dislocation, yes? Uh, but that doesn't, 
that's not enough for us to calculate theoretically the, um, uh, the, the, the solid solution strengthening. There's another element that we need, and you remember the, the, the basic formula of the theory is that the critical shear stress to, uh, uh, to get the dislocation to pass an obstacle is not only dependent on the maximum force, yeah, which we just uh, looked at, but also 1 over L, yes? The, uh, the reciprocal of the um, uh, spacing between the, um, the solutes. And, um, and so that's, a qu that's quite a, um, a challenge to determine. Hmm? Uh, because, uh, f well, first of all, we would need to know what the distribution is of our atoms, yes, necessarily. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then, uh, for instance, in this simple case here, I can have dislocations move this way, yes, and I can determine what L is. Very simple uh, from geometry here. L would be 1 over n square, where n is the planar density of my atoms here. So that would be simple. But even then, say the dislocation moves this way, yes, or at a slightly different angle. The, the distance is, would be different. So obviously determining uh, L is, is not a simple or simple task, and, and obviously it's, it's, it's got some statistics uh, into it. Yeah? And so, um, um, and that's what, you know, a, a, a big part of the uh, solid solution strengthening theories are about is uh, trying to determine what is the average spacing between obstacles in, uh, in a particular uh, solid solution uh, alloy. Hmm? Okay? And so, and there are different models, of obviously. Huh? Uh, people say different things. So, so one of the uh, uh, models, uh, uh, which is called fleischer friedel model, yes, uh, assumes, first of all, that you have a, an interaction which is localized, yes? And then it also assumes that when the dislocations move through the lattice, yes, you have a special steady state situation. I mean, that means that when a dislocation is uh, released by an obstacle, yes, it goes into a situation where that looks that's very similar to the situation it used to be in. So if it's released from one obstacle, it gets caught by one obstacle. Yeah. So, uh, so this is shown here. What I mean, s in simple terms, right? This is this location. Yes. I have a shear stress working on it. At one time, it gets released by this obstacle, yes? The next step is it's caught by one obstacle again, yes? So you get a steady state situation. Um, uh, so, so shown here, right? So uh, it's written here on the slide. So the mean distance is assumed, is computed by assuming that during the glide, we have a steady state situation. Every time a dislocation breaks away, by a from a solute, it's captured by another one, yes? And this allows us to um, uh, say that the, when a dislocation sweeps, when it does this step, when it, the, the surface it sweeps, yes, there's one solute in that surface, yes? And that, so, so say that, that surface is uh, uh, L effective square, yes? You can calculate this, hmm, assuming some uh, geometry. Hmm, and, um, and, and you basically can get the, uh, from this surface that you calculate, you can you square root of that surface for each atom. So that gives you a planar density of uh, solutes. And, and so you can get L, determine L that way. Okay? So when you do this, yes, uh, you find, I'm not going to go through theory here, 
because most of it is just uh, math, uh, you find that the, the strengthening effect proportional to the square root of the uh, atomic, the, the concentration of the solute. Now, there, there are other theories out there, yeah? Um, and, and so at the other extreme, yes, the dislocation does not interact locally with the solutes. Yeah? The interact much more diffuse. The shape of the dislocation is due to um, uh, a um, internal stresses a field around the solutes. So we have solutes, they form a random array of point-like defects, which may be attractive or repulsive, yeah? and, and you get some kind of um, you know, two-dimensional uh, pattern of attraction and repulsion, and then the dislocation kind of finds its way hmm, in, to, to, into an equilibrium position. Yeah? So it's bent into curved shape by these. So there is no sharp uh, place where you can, s where there is uh, a localized interaction between this location and the point defect. Hmm? So the dislocation are in continuous contact with this uh, interaction field, yeah? and so this is different module hmm? um, and the uh, a different model and the. Strengthening, solid solution strengthening that comes out of this theory has a different dependency on the solute concentration. Two thirds rather than one half. Yeah? Um, this theory mm, um, is also available for where you assume uh, uh, clustering of the atoms rather than them being dispersed, yes? And um, what do we have to say about these theories, okay? All right, let, let me just, um, yeah. um, okay. In, in this particular uh, model, which is mott nabarro the bush theory, hmm? uh, which is heavy on the statistics, yes? yes. Um, the uh, formula or the equation for the maximum interaction energy is also different. Mm -hmm. And the uh, reason why is, is, is has to do with the fact that we don't have a localized interaction, but a diffuse interaction, yes? Having said this, the F max still depends on, this equation is shown here, it still depends on the modulus, yes, and on the, um, the effect of the solute on the modulus and the effect of the solute on the uh, lattice parameter. Hmm? So once we know this, yes, again, uh, there are many uh, parameters in this, uh, the theory gives, us, but we can calculate, yes, if we know these parameters, the solid solution strengthening on the basis of these theories. For instance, in this case, uh, this particular uh, Morton Navarro Le Bush theory, so we can calculate the solid solution strengthening uh, from um, a solute by multiplying uh, the shear, the effect you have on the, the increase in the shear stress to move the dislocations in the presence of solutes times M, the Taylor factor, and then factors B, the Burgess factor, G, our uh, shear uh, modulus, W gives, is, um, uh, because the interaction is diffuse, W tells me how far the, um, the influence of a solute reaches. It's a few times a Burgers factor. Yeah? Uh, this is numerical parameters and, and then you see here the modulus change and the uh, delta 
um, the uh, um, uh, the effect of the uh, solute on the lattice uh, parameter. And then you have a numerical parameter here, alpha, uh, which, which is available from theory. And then C, our concentration to the two-third. Having said this, yes, that there are theories um, where the interaction, that are derived from a um, localized interaction, strong or uh, lo very localized interaction to very diffuse interaction, Solid solution strengthening remains one of these things that is difficult to tackle theoretically, yes? And there are more than one theories. And there are more than one theory, there's more than one mott Nabarro theory. There's in fact three theories, yes? We won't go into this. Um, but at the end of the day, what you find are theories which say the strengthening is proportional to the concentration, atomic concentration of the solid to one half, other theories to two thirds, other theories proportional to C, the concentration. That's the one, remember, that we used empirically, but there are theories that uh, give a proportionality with C. C to the four-thirds, C to the five-thirds even, yes? And of course, uh, you will say, uh, well, it's very simple. We can check this theory by just checking this, uh, you know, just measuring what's, the, what's this, the strengthening caused by solute as a function of the concentration. Trouble is, it's a very simple uh, idea but it doesn't work in practice because um, we, uh, the amount of alloying we can do is always very small, yes? For instance, if you, say for instance silicon, for, to name a few a small examples. As you add silicon, mm, um, you cannot add silicon indefinitely. Very quickly you run into a problem that you will have ordered structure, an ordered structure, which has properties which are very different from the, so the simple random solid solution, yes? And that's, you know, that difficulty, yes, plus uh, experimental difficulties related to getting very pure binary uh, alloys, um, has meant that to this day, you know, there are many cases, situations where we don't know what theory is better than the other one. But anyway, um, in, uh, I'll just give you my case. Um, theory that uh, I prefer to use is La Bouche theory, yes, which um, uh, so it's diffuse interaction and and for instance, this is an, a, 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 a situation for, for instance, nitrogen in an austenitic steel. Hmm? So uh, the theory that uh, you use is uh, the increase of the uh, strength due to solid solution hardening by nitrogen um, is a numerical constant, which has all the, uh, the numerical parameters like the, the modulus, etc. Uh, times the square root of the concentration of nitrogen times the, this parameter that contains the effect on the modulus and the effect on the uh, lattice parameter of the solute. Hmm? So what you have to do to, to a, a, approach this experimentally, you have to look at, well, how does the, the, the lattice parameter change with the uh, nitrogen content? How does the modulus change with the nitrogen content? Yeah? So you see here, I do have a value for delta, hmm? but the modulus change is very small, yes? So I, you can put it equal to zero, yeah? That's why um, in the equation on the right, it's delta to the two-thirds, yes? And, and, and here you have the measurements, increase of the yield strength as a function of this parameter, yes? 
where we have determined k to be 1.7 times g square root of n f to the two thirds. Yes? And you find, what you should find, is a, a, a line, a straight line. Okay? So that kind of um, tells us uh, something about uh, the way nitrogen uh, uh, strengthens austenitic steels. It's, um, I have a random, uh, the, the, the nitrogen is randomly positioned and um, it has mainly an effect by dilatation of the lattice, yes, and, um, and the dislocations, and it's a diffuse interaction, okay? So that is the conclusion, yeah? Another example here, uh, recently done, um, is the same approach. Uh, uh, this, in this case, it's a substitutional element, aluminum, in an austenitic alloy, hmm? strengthening, again, uh, numerical parameter, uh, the modulus in this case, square root of the concentration, atomic concentration of aluminum times this F, uh, which to the two thirds, which contains the parameters uh, giving me the modulus change and the lattice parameter change, which is shown here in this case. So again, lattice parameter expands as I put in my aluminum. The shear modulus in this case decreases as I add aluminum, yes? And again, I can uh, plot the increase of the strength as a function of uh, the square root of the atomic uh, or molar density, uh, concentration of aluminum times uh, the F0 parameter to the two thirds. And the straight line that I, and I, and I obtain a straight line for the parameter being about 0.474. And again, tells me that um, I'm, I'm looking at a um, dislocations that are influenced by an internal uh, stress field around the, the dislocations. Okay. Now, with um, the uh, interstitials, it's a bit different. Yes, a bit different. Uh, because, as I said, um, th there uh, the, the lattice deformation around an interstitial in ferrite is a strong tetragonal distortion. And in austenite, I can do, I can also have a, uh, a tetragonal distortion if the uh, interstitial is associated with a substitutional uh, Atom. Hmm? And in both these cases, yes, in both these cases, hmm, the uh, calculation of the interaction energy and the calculation of the um, uh, force that the dislocation has or that the point effect, the interstitial carbon or nitrogen have on the dislocation becomes very complex. Because in this case, I need to take into account crystallography and the, orient the relative orientation of the tetragonal defect with respect to the dislocation. In the previous, you know, when we did the calculation of the, the uh, interaction, we just had an edge dislocation and it didn't really matter. We didn't really have to take into account crystallography too much because the atom is just was just a, a you know a, a, a spherical region that would expand isotropically or be contracted isotropically locally. In this case, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, uh, so for instance, you you have to have a screw dislocation. Yes. Uh, for instance, this is, would be a screw dislocation with the important parameters, uh, stress parameters that we have to consider, then you have to look at your lattice distortion, your, your carbon atom, yes? And if your 
Screw dislocation, remember in alpha iron, screw dislocations are on one, one, one direction, yes? So um, your, you need to calculate what will be the interaction energy between your um, uh, carbon atom, hmm? distorted lattice, lattice distortion here, hmm? um, for all the possible positions, yes? Hmm? So you basically uh, look at your unit cell, you put in your carbon atom, and then you let your unit cell rotate around the, 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 the axis of your screw dislocation. Hmm? Okay, so it involves a little bit of matrix calculation. I will, just for you, the people who are interested, I will put it in the course material on, um, on E-class, but I'm not going to discuss it. Just for, you know, if you're interested, you can go through it. Um, this just involves, you know, um, matrix calculation. So I'll put them on, uh, on E-class. You can have a look at it. Um, and um, so you have an idea of how these things are being done. Right. And it turns out that, you know, if you go through this analysis, that uh, the maximum interaction energy is when the... Um, uh, uh, the... Um, carbon atom has this position with respect to the uh, screw dislocation. And this particular position is uh, the position where uh, phi is equal to zero. Yeah? One of the things, again, um, uh, that uh, actually happened at GFT is that um, uh, you know, people will say that you know, uh, uh, carbon atoms yes, will not interact with screw dislocations in alpha iron. Yes? And that's on the basis of if you have a screw dislocation and you have a point effect which has purely dilatational field, yes, there will be no interaction if, if you assume it's, it's isotropic, the situation is isotropic. But a screw dislocation or an edge dislocation or whatever dislocation always has very strong interaction with tetragonal uh, defects. Hmm? Okay, very strong interaction. And so if we um, um, uh, calculate the, um, uh, we go through the calculations, which, which I'll put uh, on E-class, as I said, you have the interaction energy as a function of the position of the atom. And, and then if you do the derivative of this, uh, you, can, um, you can get the interaction uh, force yeah, as a function of position. Right? So, so in, 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 um, and don't forget, this can happen in BCC and in FCC, but in the case of FCC, it's a point, it's a, uh, you always need two atoms in your, in your defect. You always need carbon atom plus a substitutional atom to create a tetragonal distortion. Now, this, um, uh, so why, why are we discussing this anyway? I told you that uh, already many times that the solubility of carbon in alpha iron was zero at room temperature. Yes, so it doesn't really matter that it has a very strong effect on a uh, very strong uh, lattice distorting effect uh, because, you know, in alpha iron you can't dissolve it anyway, right? And um, if you try to do it, instead of having a lot of carbon in solution, you get carbides, yes? Cementide. However, and this is important, in many engineering steels, yes, we we have martensite, we, we use martensite, yes? And so we have, in that case, we kind of basically force the carbon to be in solution. We, we make a supersaturated solution of carbon in ferrite, yes? And we do get a very strong tetragonal lattice distortion, and we also get a very pronounced strengthening due to the carbon in solution, yes? So this is a plot here, and I, uh, uh, 
And it also il illustrates two things. So first of all, that as you increase the carbon content, the strength will increase. And the, the, st the, the strength increase is very, very large. So the effect is very large. Yeah? The other thing that's interesting, it also illustrates the fact that um, it's actually difficult to decide, even on the basis of good data, what is the precise interaction between the dislocation and the carbon atoms. Because you can see here four uh, uh, good equations which will allow you to predict, reliably predict, the strength of martensite if you know how much carbon is in solid solution. And you see, I have two equations where the strength is proportional to the carbon concentration. One equation where it's proportional to the square root of the carbon, and one equation where it's proportional to the carbon to the one third, right? And if you plot them on top of each other, well, the, you know, it's like here for the linear and for the square root dependence, you can't see a big difference, right? And that's, that's you know, one, one of the difficulty that we uh, have with solid solution strengthening is um, the data or using the data to, to, to fit the model is uh, very often uh, uh, you know, not very, not satisfying enough. One of the important things also that this um, plot illustrates, and I want to underline this uh, at this point, is that very often you will hear people say, in relation to steels, that martensite is very hard and brittle. That martensite is, nev is not hard and brittle. It's the carbon in supersaturation that makes it brittle and hard. If there's no carbon in supersaturation, martensite is pretty soft. So you always have to make the distinction between martensite, which is a microstructure resulting from a martensitic transformation, which can happen with or without carbon, yes? But if it happens in the presence of carbon and you get carbon supersaturation, then you get a more brittle uh, material that's very hard, yes? You can make, um, there are uh, steels, we'll, we'll get, uh, talk about those um, later on, um, where um, your, uh, the carbon content is just uh, if, if, you know, very, very low, 100 ppm, yes? And um, these steels are called Mar aging steel, yes? And they're very soft. You, uh, you make a Mar aging steel, they're very soft. You can um, cold work them. You can work cold work the martensite very easily, yes? And you make them strong by precipitating, making precipitates precipitation hardening the, the microstructure, okay? So no carbon in solution, no strength. All right. A few more uh, points here uh, of uh, strengthening before uh, we, we close this chapter. So snook ordering is basically, as I already told you, is a room temperature uh, situation, yeah? room temperature aging uh, situation where carbon that is in the vicinity of dislocations can uh, basically hop into one of these energetically favorable positions and, um, and pin, as it were, uh, the uh, uh, dislocations this way. Um, so it's an instantaneous uh, process. It's stress-induced because you have the stress of the, um, the dis surrounding the dislocation allows, facilitates the jumping of the, the carbon. You don't need much carbon in solution. Very low levels, PPM levels of carbon, free carbon will already cause this effect. Yes? And, and remember, it's an effect that you see at low amounts of deformation, so when the dislocation density is not too high. 
And so you get formation of clusters hmm, by diffusion, hmm, um, uh, by uh, short-range diffusion. So this is not, hmm, this is a second remark, this is, an, this is nothing to do with Cottrell atmosphere formation, right? Cottrell atmosphere formation is a long-term process, yes, that requires um, aging at temperatures in excess of um, 100 degrees C. Hmm? So there's no long range diffusion. Hmm? And it only requires one diffusional half. So, um, so basically, uh, I already uh, told you, so if you take a material, carbon steel, uh, and you uh, deform it, there's no uh, upper yield point here. You, s you stop the deformation, you repeat it after a few seconds, yes? you find suddenly there is a yield point in your material, yes? And um, so you can look at the kinetics of this uh, process. Mm -hmm. So here you have the change in the, uh, um, the amount, this delta, this uh, increase in the yield strength, yes? And you can, from the, um, the mix, the change in slope of this, increase, determine the kinetics of this, the, the snook ordering process. Yeah? So it takes about 10 seconds here to have a very pronounced um, effect, a very pronounced yield point. Okay? And, and you can relate this with um, uh, th those kinetics with the uh, diffusion time kinetics, the time it takes, for instance, in this case it's for nitrogen, to uh, do a single diffusional hop. And you can compare the kinetics uh, with the time it takes for, uh, to achieve a maximum snook aging, yes? And, and you get the same kinetics. So basically, it's important the snook ordering is just one single jump of the uh, uh, nitrogen or carbon atom in the vicinity of the uh, dislocation. Can you count on this type of ordering, yes, to, uh, to really strengthen steels, ferritic steels? Not really. Uh, if, you, um, if, if you look at the amount of nitrogen, interstitial nitrogen, the increase in the yield strength you get from that effect is uh, about 10 megapascal. So it's not really much, hmm? not really much at all. Hmm? Um, so uh, it can be beneficial in some time, but it's not, you know, it's not never going to give you a major increase in, uh, in strength. We look uh, later on in the course, we'll, we, will, we will look at the effect of uh, what happens when you heat the material up a little bit and you, and you get long range diffusion where you have lots of carbon atoms moving towards the dislocation, you get what's called, uh, you're probably familiar with the word, Cottrell atmospheres, yes? Then you can achieve 30 to 50 meg megapascal increase in strength. So that's more appreciable. Hmm? But the snook uh, ordering itself is only about 10 megapascal in, in R. Okay. And finally, uh, I want to mention one thing, yes? And which is very important. And that's, we've been talking up to now about solid solution strengthening, yes? However, yes, solid solution strengthening is, is very often associated also with solid solution softening, okay? Uh, so let me put it this way. When, um, when we look at pure iron as a function of temperature, yes, uh, you know that we have um, a strength contributions to the strength, which are athermal, so not function of the, um, the temperature, flat. So this is strength here, strength. 
uh, and a, a temperature dependent part. Yes? Okay. As part of the athermal uh, uh, contributions, we have, for instance, the, the lattice strength. No? And, and, and the other part is, uh, well, there, there are other parts like, like grain boundaries and so, but <coughs> if we look at, <coughs> excuse me, there is a contribution due to solid solution strengthening, okay? And so uh, when I add a more solutes like silicon, yes, it basically means that every, every time I add more silicon, I increase the solid solution strengthening, yeah? But what happens is not this. The solid solution strengthening effect does not hold at lower temperatures. At lower temperatures, we get a softening. Right? This shown here, for, this is the, the um, uh, effect, the, the schematic which shows what uh, solid solution softening is. So, the black line gives me the athermal, uh, so th this part, yes, of the uh, strength of alpha iron, yes. The red line shows me what happens when I add an alloying element. So. In the flat part, I get an increase, solid solution hardening. In the temperature dependent part, I get a decrease. So I get softening. Hmm? For instance, so you, you can um, uh, look at uh, experimental data, it's shown here. So what is, this is a little bit uh, complex uh, diagram, uh, graph here, but you'll, if um, you give me some time to explain to you, it's, it'll be clear what it means. So um, here I, on, on the uh, y-axis, I put the atomic uh, uh, ratio. So it means the, the ratio, the difference between the, uh, the size of the solute with respect to the size of uh, iron atom divided by the size of the iron atom. So uh, iron, for iron I have one, right? There's no, why do I have one? Oh, so no, it's just, the, it's just the, the ratio of the atom divided, the, the ratio of the, uh, the size of the atom divided by uh, the size of the iron atom. So for iron I get one, yeah? And then for other alloying elements, such as manganese, it can be slightly lower. Or for elements such as tungsten, no? uh, niobium, titanium, I, I'm higher. Yeah? So, this, so these atoms will have a large positive delta value, yes? And these atoms will have uh, a negative delta value, hmm? according to this uh, view. Hmm? And of course, we know that the strengthening is a function of the atomic misfit. Yeah? So if I look at the, uh, the increase of the Vickers hardness with the concentration, I find, not surprisingly, that uh, the larger uh, the misfit is, the higher the increase in strength, yeah? whether it's a uh, a uh, smaller, slightly smaller atom or a slightly larger atom, yes? But if I do the same test, yes, at lower temperatures, yes, yes, at, at, my, at the uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, I don't find this. I find that the alloying, yes, the alloying results in a softening. Hmm? I get negative values for the, um, 
this is, these are negative, more negative values. Yeah? So alloying softens the material. So here you have some data, yeah? for instance, for manganese. Okay, so let me uh, use a pen perhaps here. Okay, so this here, this curve if is for 0% manganese, yes, all right. When I add manganese and I'm looking at room temperature, room temperature around 300 Kelvin, I see I add manganese, it gets stronger. I add more manganese, it gets even stronger. And I add lots of manganese, it's very strong, right? But you see here, at these two levels here, one about 2%, as I go to lower temperature, the strength has decreased. Same here with uh, nickel. So this is our original data for alpha aran. Yes. As I increase the nickel at room temperature, I get hardening. But below room temperature, I get softening. Huh? Okay. So something is happening here that, uh, that we don't really like, hmm? um, uh, which, uh, which we need to explain. You know, because how can it be that you have an atom and then at one temperature it does one thing and the other temperature is the other thing? So there's something wrong with the theory, right? No, there's nothing wrong with the theory. The reason why we see the softening in alpha iron hmm, is related to the structure of the, the core structure of the screw dislocations. You remember that the reason why we have this very strong increase in the athermal part of the uh, strength of alpha iron is related to the fact that the core structure of the dislocation is spread out over different planes, yes? And that is what happening when, what's happening when you put in solutes. The solutes will have an effect on the spread of the um, the core of the dislocations, the screw dislocations. So, and, well, what is kind of the conclusion when it becomes lower, it basically means that it reduces the spread of the core of the um, screw dislocation. So, in fact, it's not really a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing because this very high increase in the, f in the, in the, s the, s the stress yes, uh, for alpha iron is actually a big problem because it makes it very difficult for dislocations to move, i.e. to deform. Yes, the, the deformation in, uh, of alpha iron will be very difficult as I reduce the temperature. By alloying it, yes, I make it easier again. Yes? And that's where um, these uh, alloying elements and this alloy softening uh, becomes important. As a matter of fact, um, uh, one of the ways in which uh, people design um, steels uh, where it's very critical to uh, make sure that the, the so-called ductile to brittle transition temperature is very low, yes, is by adding nickel, yes. By adding nickel, we get this, uh, enough of this softening effect at low temperatures that the, that the ductile to brittle temperature is uh, decreased. Hmm? So what happens, how can we explain, um, without going into too much theory, um, uh, what is happening here? How can we have at low temperature a um, easier uh, uh, glide, yes? And at high temperature, a more difficult glide, you know? uh, 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 obstacles, the, the point defects working enough. Well, it's shown here. Hmm? 
um, you remember that at lower temperatures, so in this region here, where we have this strong pronounced uh, uh, thermal component to the flow stress, hmm, we have the uh, double kink, the kink pair uh, mechanism of screw dislocation motion, yes? And there are two important energies here, yes? As I said, first of all, you need to nucleate the kinks, yes? The double kink nucleation energy. And then you need to have the kinks move along the um, uh, potential uh, hill, yes? Laterally to have the dislocation, screw dislocation move, yeah? So what do, what do these uh, solutes do? Well, they facilitate the formation of double kinks by reducing the double kink nucleation energy. So it's about 0 0.6, yeah? so you add solute that decreases. So it's easier to make, and the re why is it easier? Well, simply because the, uh, the spread of the, the core of the screw dislocation is reduced, yes? That's basically what they do. And then, on the other hand, they increase the kink migration energy. So the energy that's required for the kinks to move laterally, yes? So, and, and, and that's, that's the reason why at low temperature you get a uh, pronounced uh, softening because the double kink energy goes down and at higher temperature you get, remember at higher temperature the dislocations will cross many Pyrrhal's valleys, uh, Pyrrhal's uh, hills, yes? So, and then if they encounter the uh, the nickel atoms or manganese atoms, these will work as obstacles, yes? Hmm? Okay? So that is the key to the uh, solid solution softening. And again, I, uh, I want to stress the fact that this is not necessarily uh, a, a bad thing. So I have one, uh, two more minutes, and... Just want to introduce um, what we'll be talking about on Monday. So, at last lectures, we've been, we've been talking about um, how dislocations, their motion is influenced by uh, solutes hmm, as they move in the, in, in, in the, in the glide plane. And, um, and we saw there were two important parameters there. The, the, the strength of the interaction between the point defect, the solute, and, and the dislocation. And, uh, and the, the distance, the average distance between the, the, the solutes. And although I said, you know, you had theories and you could calculate it, yes, um, in general, the results that you get from doing that in alloy design uh, when it comes to calculate solid solution strength are not much better than if you had used an empirical approach. Yes? So unless you're doing really advanced research in solid solution hardening, you know, you're welcome to use the empirical approach. You'll, you'll get pretty good data. Um, although it, you, know, you may not have an, uh, a strong theoretical basis for your results. Um, alternatively, of course, if you're doing a PhD on solid solution strengthening, you know, it's, it's better to, to have a look at those theories. Um, now, so we have dislocations. Um, as, as we strain materials, we generate dislocations by you know, frank read sources, and these dislocations will run into each other. Yes, that will give you hardening. Yes, from a um, a point of view of um, uh, a strengthening, yes, it's not a really interesting way to strengthen a material because if you do that, 
you know, increasing the dislocation density and using that as a way to strengthen material, of course you lose plasticity, right? So it's not, we don't use that. You know, if, a, if a car maker wants a high strength material, POSCO doesn't deform the material and then deliver it, right? That's, so that's not a strengthening mechanism. However, we look into it because it will allow us to calculate stress-strain curves. Yes? And, you'll, and we'll see that um, in the coming lectures, how we can do this. And, and, and so it's kind of useful after all. Okay? So we'll talk about this on Monday.